Uh, it's 7 o'clock now, I think we'll get started. Um, my name is Ken Benton, I'm a teaching naturalist here at the North Branch Nature Center. Um, and I'm just going to keep things very short and sweet because I'm really looking forward to this talk. I know all of you are probably as well. Um, just a couple things to mention. This is our kid, um, Naturalist Journeys talk of the winter. We have one more coming up on March 20th, and that's on the Moose of Yellowstone and Isle Royale. Um, that one also should be a fantastic talk. Um, we have our field marks in the lobby over there. We also have our new calum, spring calendars has all of our new upcoming programs. And rather than list them off, I'll just let you pick those up if you're interested. Um, and without further ado, we have Charlie Cogbo. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, 10 years ago, I gave a talk on the pre-settlement forests of Vermont to this group. And um, I'm going to give the same talk, except there's going <laughs> to be a 10-year update. And I've been working for 10 years on what's going on. Um, uh, I encourage you to ask questions. Sometimes I can talk off in either a different language or it's English, but no one understands the words, including me. So um, please uh, pipe in if you have any questions whatsoever. Um, I'm going to be talking about the pre-settlement forests of the Northeast. We'll define pre-settlement early on. No offense to the indigenous, but I'm not going to really uh, uh, address them. They've been around as long as the forest has uh, and are intimately part of that forest and its dynamics. Uh, but I consider settlement Euro-American settlement when the original people came over from, from Europe or when Americans started to move inland. Uh, and forests, you know what a forest is. Um, northeast is basically the, the quarter of the country, um, including New England, New York, mid-Atlantic states. I'm going to be interdisciplinary. I'm going to be talking about models, theoretical things that might happen or might not happen, but tend to be the academics, um, uh, Bailey Wick. Uh, this, by the way, is uh, the diorama at the Harvard Forest, uh, the Fisher Museum of the pre-colonial forest. It's based on uh, a forest in Winchester, New Hampshire, the Pisgah Tract that blew down in 1938. Uh, and uh, Harvard uh, owned it, but then lost what they consider to be the last virgin forest of New England, uh, they thought. Um, <laughs> uh, here I am in an earlier stage. Uh, if you look very closely, there's a person there with a little ax. I like to think of that as a surveyor. There's another one down there. there uh, it isn't um, uh, not humanly uh, uh, involved. There were people in the forest, uh, including the indigenous. Um, here, uh, we're going to be talking about natural history in the field. Uh, basically, what's out there today? Can it tell us something what the original forests were like? Uh, this is in uh, a Franconia Notch, um, a Lafayette Brook. Um, uh, you can actually park in the parking lot and see this, uh, this view, very accessible. Um, in the uh, Franconia Notch Highway. And finally, I'm going to be talking a lot about history, um, of the data, uh, information that was contemporary uh, to the pre-settlement era. And here I am in, in actually the Callis Town Hall, um, looking at a original lotting map. Oh, come on. Easy. OK, um, no, no talk about the original forest can't be poetic. Uh, this is uh, Longfellow's A Tale of a KD. Uh, this is the forest primeval, the murmuring pines and hemlocks bearded with moss and garments green, indistinct in the twilight stand like druids of eld with voices sad and prophetic. The first stanza of uh, Evangeline, uh, uh, a um, story of love lost and, and, and never gained again. Um, and here is uh, a, a lot of ecology. They have species. They have uh, other understory plants. They have a little bit of, of spirit um, uh, involved in it. And this is what we tend to think of when we think of the original forest. Uh, I have a, a lexicon uh, of at least 50 terms. Um, primeval, uh, old growth, uh, maybe a, a forester call it decadent. Um, uh, various names for this concept. They're all adjectives. I call it adjectives in search of a noun. <laughs> That's what I'm looking for. What is the noun in this, in this story? Um, 
OK, um, we'll start off with an essential question. What was the forest like? This is um, Green Mount Cemetery in Montpelier. You've all driven by it. Um, uh, you can see there's a lot of color there and a little bit of, of invasive uh, uh, European um, conifers. Uh, what do you think this looked like in 1787, when it was originally that part of Montpelier was settled? Uh, was the dominant sugar maple the way it is here? Was it white pine? By the way, this was set aside as the white pine lot in Montpelier, a quarter <laughs> acre that every settler in Montpelier had a piece of this, this uh, uh, lot. Um, that they used, uh, or at least uh, had white pines on it ostensibly. Was it hemlock? Was it beech? Was it yellow birch? Red spruce? Red oak? The south-facing slopes in the Winooski Valley have a lot of red oak. What was it like? Anybody think it was sugar maple? Well, good. All right. <laughs> it's big three. Yeah, it couldn't be better. White pine? Yeah, yeah, of uh, uh, Maine, the White Pine State, that kind of thing. Hemlock? All right. Beach? Has anyone yes. been to my talks before? Yeah. Yes. Um, yellow birch? All right, good. Red spruce? That's my totem tree. I'm voting. <laughs> uh, red oak? OK, the essential question here is not what it was, but how do we discover what it was? How can we answer that question without a vote? Um, it isn't democracy. It, it's, it, it's science. So we'll go on. Keep that in mind. Um, this is really a tale, at least a tale of four forests. This is a picture from Hanover, New Hampshire, right above Lake Hitchcock. This is all glacial till. Uh, you can recognize the, the big class and the, and, and, and the uh, 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 unsorted material here. Um, and um, uh, there are at least four forests that I see here. Everyone see the four forests? Okay, the one forest here is down in the organic matter where the till was laid down. That's the post glacial forest. It's still there as organic matter, not as big trees. Um, then this is the, the really neat one. Uh, see, right, this stone wall. The stone wall was put down by the original settler or that cleared the land, and the forest floor that was there, he sequestered. He hid below the rocks so that we could come back 200 years later and see what was growing there. So this is the pre-settlement forest. Number two is right underneath that stone wall. The third forest is represented by these white pines up here, which grew up in this field after it was abandoned, after maybe 100 or 150 years of cultivation. It was abandoned, and the white pines came up. Then the white pines were taken over by hardwood trees that were growing up in this field. That's the fourth forest. Then those hardwood trees were cut, and we're missing the fifth forest. What would grow here in the future? Unfortunately, right now, it's a condominium. <laughs> Literally, this, I can go to this. But it had four forests originally. Why do I get two for the price of one? Let's go back. Oh, I get it. Just delayed. Hmm. Good. Yeah, you got that? Uh, that was a quickie. Um, we can go back in time. We can go back uh, uh, using um, pollen diagrams. This is from a Knob Hill pond in Marshfield um, uh, that has a pollen diagram taken out of it. The bottom of the sediments, which is the oldest uh, deposits, are 13,000 years ago. Each of these columns is a different genera or species of trees, look closely at the blue, which is spruce. Spruce came in very early and then declined. The red is um, hemlock. Hemlock came in about, um, who knows, 11,000 years ago. Was a, a, almost a dominant until 5,000 years ago when it virtually disappeared. The great hemlock decline of 5,300 years ago. <laughs> Maybe to be repeated. 
Then it took about a thousand years for hemlock to come back and is in here. And finally, beech that came in about 8,000 years ago increased and then kind of held its own more or less. This is a detail of the top of the diagram, the last 2,500 years. This line across here is settlement. You can see all these um, ambrosia and, and uh, maize and uh, grasses coming in. This is when Europeans started to settle. Notice there's no maize down here. The natives weren't growing it around here, um, although the Europeans were. Uh, so this is the settlement horizon. And you can see coming from the bottom, we have spruce all of a sudden showing up 1,800 years ago, increasing to about 100 years ago, and then declining. There's dynamics going on. Here's hemlock that had recovered from the hemlock decline and has been declining slowly for the past 1,000 years. Here's um, a beach, which was higher back here in the uh, 3,000 years ago, oh, and has been declining slowly. So if we wanted to guess what the forest was, yes? What's the other big black one there and the other big black one next to the This bed? one is birch, OK? And this one is percent organic matter. Don't worry about it. It just means how many plants were around. And uh, you can see the organic matter here is very low. Uh, way back in the uh, post-glacial, just when the, the ice was leaving and then builds up to a fairly constant. Oh, there are a lot of details in here. You, you could, I could spend an entire time talking about this. <laughs> but um, my takeaway here is that things are dynamic and we can take that pre-settlement layer and say that the forests around Knob Hill Pond, which looked like that at the turn of the 1900s, had spruce, pine, hemlock, dominated by birch, a little bit of oak, a lot of, 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 of beech, and a, a lesser amount. The amount of pollen does not equal land on number 10 pond in the present town of Pallas. And we can go to Norbury. Here, here's uh, Gale's description. And he has witness trees on the four corners of this Norbury, this New York land. He has an, uh, an elm tree, a red ash tree, a birch tree, a maple tree, and he has other beeches and birches. This is a pretty good description of northern hardwoods. And rich sites, uh, uh, where is the, there's butternut, ash, birch, patches of butternuts with maidenhair and nettles. It's there today. What was there 250 years ago is what's, what's on this line today. Uh, we should really resurvey this, have a 250-year resurvey mm -hmm. of the land. Um, this all got me to uh, mostly Hubbard Brook, but uh, other uh, ideas that we did have um, information from these trees to look at witness trees, look at the original survey corners. And that's what the original survey is used to mark lots was to um, mark the corners and tell what the species was. They called them witness trees. You can tell today because they have a sign on them, witness tree. They used to put a post at the corner of the lot and then blaze trees around it. Those are witness trees. This is a, a witness tree in Maine. Um, uh, in 1789, the northwest corner of the Kennebec Purchase is this location. Started at a marked beech tree. That's the son of the beech. Um, right there, you can see the blazes. Not the same tree, but probably genetically, since it sprouts the same. And that's Ephraim Ballard. Anyone ever heard of Ephraim Ballard? You probably heard of Martha Ballard, the midwife's tale, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning. Uh, that was his wife. And in the midwife's tale, he talked, she talks about her husband going off to work in the woods. This is what he was doing. He was marking trees. Um, um, uh, there. there is only one witness tree that I know that survives from the, the 18th century. Um, that is in the um, a deed office in Bangor, Maine. Uh, this tree was a 1792 witness tree and part of an 1880s timber trespass suit. So it's, it, you know, the surveyor cut the blaze out of the tree to show that that was the tree that was at the corner. And it still survives. It's in a glass case now um, in, in Bangor. 
Um, that is an original witness tree right there in my hands. Um, and I've been um, pursuing for over 40 years now, going around and getting records uh, in archives of the original survey records and then pulling out witness tree data from those surveys. Okay, um, this just shows that, that work. Um, if you know the, uh, the former town clerk of, of Callis, this is a piece of parchment uh, that has an original survey on it. This is the, the, the vault in Montpelier with the survey of Montpelier. Um, there's a lot of records just sitting around. Um, this is that original parchment from Callis. Um, oh, I didn't show you the, the, um, the archive. It's the, um, uh, Eva used to have a, um, uh, actually a filing cabinet, I guess the best way to put it, that she used to keep this map in, in a piece of, uh, um, you know, folder. But here is the original uh, lots in Callis, and you can see at the corner of each there's an M, an M, an E. At this place, this is the Max Gray Road, or extension of the Max Gray Road that becomes the East uh, Road in, in Callis. And at that corner, there is a M, which is a maple. That is in the middle of the road. They didn't like to put the roads to the middle of the lot. They put them along the edge of the lot. And here's that corner. Uh, and you can see the maples lined up on the tree line. Unfortunately, the original witness tree is now long gone under the road. But we can add up what the composition was in 1783 uh, uh, or in uh, Montpelier in 1787. And here are the pre-settlement composition in central Vermont. Here are the Montpelier witness trees, 186 on the map. And these are percentages, so the dominant was maple. Oh, wow. <laughs> but there's also beech, hemlock, spruce, much less of birch. In Callis, the dominant was beech, with lesser amounts of maple, hemlock, and spruce. In Cabot, the dominant was beech, with lesser amounts of maple and spruce. And very importantly, in the third division of Montpelier, this is the white pine lot in Montpelier. That original question, here's the answer to your, 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 you've been waiting for. Uh, beech dom um, uh, spruce dominated 45%, beech 21%, um, maple 11 virtually pine none. Hemlock. Hemlock. hemlock, yeah. Excuse me, 45, dominated by hemlock. <laughs> yep. Hemlock people won. Uh, white pine, white pine uh, there, there will be an argument that white pines were, were saved for their timber, so they weren't marked. But that's begging the question. Ooh. A blaze on a pine tree is not going to change its value all that much. The thing is that pines were big and obvious, but were very scattered, probably less than one per, per acre or one per quarter acre, it, it, it just wasn't all, all that abundant. What yep. family is a lever wood? Lever wood. Uh, we're going to get to that in a second. Uh, the answer is hawthorn beam. Oh, Do you okay. speak Latin? Australia, Virginiana. Um, uh, but uh, they didn't have that in Europe. So they gave it names here. And um, lever wood is one of the local, local names. Uh, here's the composition, uh, again, in the towns in um, uh, central eastern Vermont. Um, this is Plainfield. Um, anyone want to help me go through the town records? I've been through them several times. Uh, this is Barry. Uh, Orange, we have Gale's original survey. But there are some towns missing here. And this is the composition with the greens being conifers, the reddish ones being hardwoods, the blue ones being uh, conifer, temperate conifers, hemlock and pine, and the yellows and oranges being oak, uh, chestnut, and hickory, the sprout hardwoods from the south. And you can see a dominant of this uh, russet color, which is beech. The dominant tree in central Vermont at settlement was beech. Charlie? Yeah. Have you cross reference uh, beams and Old buildings, for instance? I've looked at old buildings and mostly just the species. Mm -hmm. um, 
And it is true that as you go from southern New England to northern New England, the, the timber framing changes. Changes from oak, white oak on the coast, chestnut uh, in the interior in the Hudson Valley, through hemlock in southern Vermont, and finally spruce predominantly in northern New England. But we don't have all that many really old buildings, but the ones we have, you should core, to, uh, excuse me, take a small sample out of the, out of the beams, or the, uh, not the sills, but the, the joists that run under it. And you can get an anecdotal sample of what species were going locally. Even more so, you can get the growth rate of those trees and figure out you know, what the climate was like in 1815 when we had no summer. Um, I've done this for over uh, 1,400 towns in the northeast and this is just and this is the squinting eye view see green up north and it goes through the reds uh, through vermont goes through the blues here which are these transition pines and hemlocks light blue hemlock dark blue pine down through the oaks and chestnuts mostly oak um, down in southern new england uh, also um, uh, we don't stop at the border this was all british territory uh, the eastern township has equal surveys and these are witness trees from the eastern townships that are just in the database. Uh, yeah? How much clearing happened before there were enough settlers to split it up into towns? Um, the the um, model was to survey before settlement. Because okay. if you didn't survey, you didn't know who owned what. And at least in New England, they were proprietors. They were groups of anywhere from 50 to 60 people that bought the town in common and their job as proprietors was to divide it up both on the land and then ownership. So the, the rule of thumb is survey before settlement. So you didn't have um, groups of loggers getting ship's mass and stuff? No, and or squatters or, yeah. or, or whatever. Occasionally you'd have somebody there, but remember this, these witness trees are on the edge of the lot, which simply means that the lot, um, um, actually it was, it's illegal to disturb a, um, a survey boundary. Still is today. Don't take that pin out of your corner. Um, uh, the trees were, were to be remain because they indicated the boundary between two people, and then you had to argue over your neighbor of who's disturbing it. You know, they're stealing from you, or you're stealing from them. Uh, come on. <laughs> it's incredible work, Charlie. Have the giant pines for mass. No, no. A quick digression of the King's Arrow Pine, uh, uh, starting before 1775, when the English crown still owned the land, all pines over two feet in diameter to reserve for the King's Navy. The records show that a thousand trees were sent to England for masts. Do you realize how much land for a thousand trees? You know, it's one town in southeastern uh, uh, New Hampshire. Uh, we do have uh, 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 rumors that uh, 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 King's Arrow pine trees survived or there was poaching. There's no record whatsoever of anyone being prosecuted over taking a big pine. There are nice stories of, of flooring and houses that's 23 inches wide everywhere. <laughs> it could be 26, 28. The, 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 the governor of New Hampshire wasn't which was Benny Wentworth, by the way. He owned 500 acres in every town. He didn't have to come and, and fine you for, for using a tree on your own lot. So I tend to tamp down on King's Arrow Pine. This is getting to terminology. Um, this is a maple vernacular usage. That is, uh, how many sugar maple trees were there in Vermont originally? None. They didn't have a name. Sugar maple was a Pennsylvania and, and New York name. This is the pre-settlement names. The name in Vermont was hard maple. If you're a real Vermonter, you have hard maple. And the other maple, that we might call red maple, down here, was called soft maple, hard and soft. If you're from Maine, you called it rock maple. And the opposite of rock maple was white maple. So we have different terms, um, local terms, vernacular. Um, the really neat ones are the, what we call ironwood. Uh, see these uh, green here? This is lever wood, the green in here, uh, which was a Vermont name for, for uh, this iron wood. Uh, in Windsor County, it was called Riemann, only in Windsor County. In Maine, it was called Hornbeam. 
And out in New York and Pennsylvania, it was called ironwood. And it also had other, blue beech is a different species, but it could be in uh, southern New England, it could be called hazel, not witch hazel. This is a tree hazel. Um, gum, gum is the best of trees. It, it doesn't, its uh, genus doesn't occur in Europe. And uh, it doesn't occur much in Vermont, although Colchester Bog and here down in, in southeastern uh, Vermont. But uh, around New York City, in New York, it's called Pepperidge. Everyone seen Pepperidge Farm? Have you seen the logo of Pepperidge Farm? It's a mill with a maple tree beside it. Pepperidge Farm. Pep uh, oh. They don't know what they're talking about. Um, in in uh, Connecticut and um, Rhode Island, it's called Swampwood. In um, central to northern New England, it's called Wild Pear. So you can tell where an original settler was from, if we want to interview them, of uh, just what do we call uh, that. By the time they got to Pennsylvania, they're just calling it gum. You have the German and French names, too? Yeah, they're uh, uh, not much, and, and native names. Wikipedia is, is um, uh, uh, basswood in Algonquin, uh, or Abenaki. Uh, we do have some Dutch names. Um, uh, but uh, most of these, are, by the way, most of the surveyors were Scots, the kind of uh, higher class um, of refugees um, uh, coming in. Um, that was a little bit biased, but yeah. Going back a slide too, so it was, it was hard maple in Vermont, the term for sugar maple. Yep. And then rock maple in Maine. Maine, and the pear was hard maple, soft maple, rock maple, white maple. Don't get confused. Many people today call silver maple white maple. Mm -hmm. So you've got to talk the language of the time. Soft maple in Vermont would have meant? What we call red maple okay. today. Thank you. Yeah. You said that they had different names because they didn't have the trees, the same tree in Europe. And, and certainly in ironwood and, and gum, it was the multiple names. Mm -hmm. uh, when you get to, to maples, um, you're really talking about um, they're, they're putting a species name on it, and the species names develop through time. Actually, the Latin names came before the species names, and they usually came from the species name. So Acer rubrum is the Latin name. So if you translate that into English, you get red maple. But the surveyors weren't talking Latin. They were talking English. So they called it soft maple or white maple. So what trees, if any, were identical to between Europe and, and North America? We share almost no species. We share um, maybe 70, 80% of the genera. So that, that's where the, the ironwood gets, gets the hazel comes. In, in Europe, they have a hazel, which is a carpinus. So when they came here, they saw something that looked like carpinus, which was really Australia, that's now back to carpinus, that they called hazel. A little complicated. Um, these are the species distributions, and you can see that beech was in a, a band in northern New England. Maple was much less important, maybe 6%. In uh, Vermont, it got up maybe to 15% in some locations. Oaks, the dotted line is the current distribution of oak in the um, 1990s. Uh, the colors are oak distribution, and you can see the dominance in southern New England. But the range is very, very close. In fact, I'd say the range from the pre-settlement is a better indication of the range than the range is today. It's been screwed around with logging and planting and all that kind of stuff. And pines, look at pines, hardly any in, in Vermont. The dominant pines are out here on, on Cape Cod and in the Merrimack Valley and the Saco Valley. And that was mostly pitch pine. White pine was a, a relative rarity. Charlie, these are all current maps? No. All the colors are 1800. Okay. All the dotteds are current. Here were spruce in 1800, going down into western Massachusetts and Worcester County, uh, in the mountains in Maine. Uh, hemlocks, the same band through here, but uh, shifted a little south. Chestnut. This is what the American Chestnut Society should see. See how much chestnut there was in Berkshire County and Bennington County? But very little in the rest of the state. The range of chestnut in the pre-settlement was beyond the range of chestnut. 
that the American Chestnut Society Foundation uh, has there. And hickory is much the same as chestnut. You can see there, uh, there's a little more detail. Oh. Okay. Um, here we're going to a classification, and this is the kind of final piece of, if you take all the species and you do fancy arm-waving mathematics to get towns that have similar uh, spectra of species, a similar composition, and color those towns the same color, it's called cluster analysis. We're clustering towns that have the same composition. And here in Vermont, you can see the, the major uh, green mountain chain has this um, um, color here. Uh, the Champlain Valley has a, a, a darker color, which is more northern hardwoods. In fact, there's some towns within the Champlain Valley that are getting over to that yellow color, just barely. Um, and then in the Northeast Kingdom, you have the green, which are the, the, the softwoods uh, from the north. And this is the real map of variability in composition of forest types in Vermont in 1800. So wait, so what are, what do all the colors designate? The colors are just the colors. They are a cluster. They are towns that have similar composition. But what, so is, the, what is composition? Composition is the relative abundance of uh, the different species, beech, birch, maple, hemlock, pine. And you do a, you do a similarity, and then you do a, a matrix, and then you do a, a, a principal components analysis. See? So it's not Don't forest ask. community necessarily. Call it forest community, yeah. Okay. I call it forest type for, because yes. it's simply associated with a spectra, a, a, a set composition. Is the white joint simply unidentified? White is no data. And here we are for the whole Northeast with the same thing. And I want to point out here, that the greens and the reds separate from the yellows, oranges, and blues by a very distinct line. It isn't a straight line by any means. This is the tension line. The separation between the northern forests, dominated by beech early on, and the southern forests, dominated by oak. And there are a few really neat, look at this, in the, in the Merrimack Valley, in the Connecticut Valley, in the Hudson Valley, uh, in the Allegheny Valley, um, in the Susquehanna Valley, there are tongues going north of oak. Similarly, there's tongues going south in the Poconos. Uh, Cam um, Cambria County, Pennsylvania. It's an outlier. Jay uh, maybe it was the flood in Jamestown, who knows. Um, but uh, uh, an outlier there. This going down into northern Connecticut, um, um, through the Berkshires uh, as an outlier. And then we have these northern areas. This is the Penobscot Valley. These are the Camden Hills. We have s a very few towns, few scattered towns. There are southern towns that occur in the north, almost no northern towns that are, occur in the south. It's a very distinct line. Um, and it's a line between beech and oaks. You can see that line here. the tension line, the dividing line between the southern forest and the northern forest. Uh, this is a fancy uh, analysis of that. If you look at the distance between towns and what their, the distance between their similarities, in other words, look at their geographic distance and their taxonomic difference, and you plot that. This is the geographic distance and this is the, the taxonomic difference. If you put all the towns together, it's the blue. And as you get further apart, they get less alike. And you cross the 50% line at about 150 kilometers. However, if you take northern towns, the green, or southern towns, and do them alone, don't mix the north and the south, you get the 50% line is somewhere up here around 400 kilometers. And if you go across the tension line, you just cross it by 27. 50% is 20 kilometers. In other words, the amount of change over the tension line is for 20 kilometers is equivalent to 300 kilometers, either north or south. It's very steep. It's the definition of an ecotone, a rapid change of ecological characteristics. Um, I've been working with the Paleon group, which is putting together these witness tree records for the entire Northeast. Uh, we're going from Minnesota to Maine. And this is 
these are from witness tree records from the whole area. And here is spruce, here is oak. You can see the tension line here. Uh, excuse me, it's right there. It goes across, cross, cross, cross. Right through Stillwater, by the way. Where is he? Okay. Um, this is just the composition of the original forest over all of Vermont. 34% beech, 15% maple, 13% hemlock, 11% spruce, 9% birches, ashes. And we have some other things. We have, uh, you know, um, butternuts and a few hickories. Very few poplars, cherries, um, uh, chestnut. Um, any foresters out there? Cherries, poplars, chestnut, only growing in disturbed areas after cuts in a lot of light. These species growing in shade. It's kind of coming around to climax on the backside. There are a series of species that, that represent shade tolerant and a, species, a group of species that are very rare early on that are shade intolerant. Um, I'm just about there. Um, uh, just to show you, there are other data that you can pull out of, of these records. This is the percentage of the survey line that's described as burnt and in red and wind thrown in um, uh, uh, blue. If you do some uh, high grade mathematics, take the reciprocal and assume that 25 years it's still visible, 1% uh, equals 500 years return time. So, oh, excuse me, 5% uh, is 500 years. So these, the only place is in northern um, uh, New York and, and part of Allegheny that has a 500 year return time on fire at any location. None of the, of the wind throws come close to that. The wind throw is closer to 2,000 year return time. These are not the disturbances that dominated the early forest. We didn't have fire. We didn't have wind throw. Um, I've been working uh, on trying to get some more metrics. Uh, I can pull out a little bit. Uh, the witness tree, sometimes they measure the distance to the witness tree. And you take one over that squared. That is actually the density of trees in that location. Um, and this, these are numbers from various areas of the Northeast, which is the density of trees more than 20 centimeters, trees per hectare. If you're, if you're English speaking, you can divide that by 2.47, uh, two and a half, and you'll get trees per acre. Um, but this, uh, there's just a little glimmer of that, our pine. The problem is that Jersey uh, was two different states, East Jersey and West Jersey. Um, East Jersey has very good settlement records. West Jersey was Quaker, and the records are not as good. <laughs> uh, it was more common on the ship. Uh, also, you notice that Mason-Dixon line stops. And that's because southern plantation large land holdings were the land tenure system in the south. And they have a very different survey. They survey the outlines, but the outlines tend to be very subjective. Um, they tend to be harder to find because they're they're registered in the counties, and the counties always change. So uh, there's a good reason why this goes to Pennsylvania and then starts where the federal land survey, the so-called public land survey, starts in Ohio. In Ohio West, all the way to the West Coast, the numbers are fantastic. You, you lose yourself in too many numbers. I'm from West Jersey, so I can relate to there, some of that history. Um, I need somebody to go to Trenton and look in the, um, oh, what are they called? It's the West Jersey proprietors. Their provider records are in uh, the state archives in Trenton. Yeah, do me a favor. Well, I know Ironwood is not always called Ironwood, but when people call Ironwood Ironwood, why do they call it? Because it's very hard and dense. Okay. okay. And that's why they call it leaferwood. I mean, if you're if you're an old Vermont farmer, you say, "All oh, right, I've got to move this rock. Um, bring me a lever in a stone boat." Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, may, uh, runners or, or skids on, uh, yeah. Is there uh, any evidence of what caused the die-off of the hemlocks uh, in the ancient uh, forest? There are three theories. Uh, in, in the same layers in the ponds, there, there are wings of um, hemlock um, looper. 
Okay. Now, did the lupin follow the decline and eat off of dead trees or not? There's also very good uh, evidence that there were, there were droughts and climate triggers going on at that time. And the final evidence is, even though the original observation said that it was, it was contemporaneous within 100 years over all of Eastern North America, there are places that didn't decline. So why didn't they decline? They were affected by the drought, the, the, the looper was around, whatever. Right now, it's just said it's an example of a major decline, probably caused by either a pathogen or a pest or, or a climate or a combination of those. Okay, have you given any thought to where the forests are headed with the disease in the birch and the hemlock and the can? I can every species, I can give you ash, uh, butternut, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, maples, hemlock, uh, um, um, dogwoods. Uh, uh, I like to, and I, I developed this long ago, talking with pathologists. They were convinced that every tree was sick and about to die. <laughs> and they were absolutely right. Mm -hmm. Every tree is sick and about to die. It's a lot like humans. Uh, we all have issues and we have a, a limited lifespan. Um, that doesn't mean that they're going to die before they reproduce or before they have an influence or whatever. Uh, so I, I tend to fall back on a Hugh Routes description. He was a, a non-believer in climax, a vehemently non-believer of climax. Um, and he was uh, once asked apocryphally, uh, what do you think the future of the forest is? What would be the climax of this area? And, and what would the forest be like? And without skipping a beat, he said, trees. <laughs> And that's the way I feel. I really feel. Whether it's going to be maple trees or hemlock trees or red maple trees or, or whatever, it probably won't be chestnut, it probably won't be hemlock, but it'll be something. And we just have to accept that. That's just the normal thing. The, the, we've only been 10,000 years since we had nothing. So let's not complain about, oh, this species isn't going to make it. That's I think that's the the question. Pretty anticlimactic answer. Yes, uh, I'll remember that. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't remember you saying anything about elms. Were there elms around at that time? They weren't terribly common. Um, they showed up at 1% or, or thereabouts. Uh, there were two species that were, were viable here. There was a slippery a red elm and an American or white elm or whatever you want to call it. Um, uh, so they did occur on the floodplains, which is where we see uh, iconic pictures, but they also occurred on the uplands. And uh, at least right now, at least about 20% of the elms are resistant to uh, Dutch elm disease. So we still have elms around. We don't have them in street trees. But the street trees are, you know, um, a little bit artificial. But, but do they, the Dutch elm, there's not a Dutch elm, right? Uh, the, uh, there is an elm in, in, in Europe that had that's fairly resistant to Dutch elm disease, and it's called Dutch elm disease because it was brought over on nursery stock from Europe. From Dutch. and most of the elms around here are American elms, then. Um, Virgin, many uh, actually get on little calcareous soils in, in Champlain Valley or whatever, and you will get slippery elm. It's around. And you, can, and, and you can easily tell it. Just take your knife and cut a piece of the bark and see whether it's a, um, a marble cake or whether it's a chocolate cake. <laughs> Charlie, one of your earliest slides shows the four forests. Basically, it was a picture of yeah. kind of deforestation of the stone wall. Yeah. You mentioned forest number two was under the stone wall. Yeah, absolutely. Tell us a little bit more about the that, that, That's my um, tease for anybody that wants to know what the pre settlement forest is. The remains of that, of the pollen from those forests, and the organic matter from those forests, which could be put through genetic stuff, is sitting underneath a flat rock under every stone wall, or every early stone wall. And almost all the stone walls were 1820 or 1830 latest. So all you have to do is um, dissect the stone wall, which is a, an activity in itself, because you can see what size it is and how much they weigh and what the shapes are and where they came from and all sorts of neat things. And then at the very bottom, uh, in a place that hasn't gotten any exposure to, the, to, to erosion or, or air, 
there's a little bit of organic matter left over from the forest when that wall was built. Uh, good, good activity, although you need a pond lab. How big a scoop of that would you need to find something up from it? Teaspoon. A teaspoon. Okay. Yep. Actually, it was that was done at Harvard Forest uh, about ten years ago, or thereabouts, and they, they came up with a lot of field species and brambles. Obviously, the stone wall was built a little after <laughs> the field was, but, but somewhere around there, there. I mean, stone walls on either side of a, a sugar bush you could. What's changed since ten years ago when you gave this talk? Okay, the first um, of four um, slides were the same. <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, some of the maps uh, uh, 10 years ago were just New England. Cool. And as you notice, I'm getting into the West and I'm getting into Canada, and next up probably is, is New Brunswick. If all the white spots on the map were really bothering me. Um, <laughs> There, there, there are reasons for many of them, but they're, 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 they're fodder for the next, for filling it in. Even though we don't need that, with uh, computer smoothing techniques, I can make it look as if I've sampled everything. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there are a third of a million trees represented in that, the big map from Minnesota to Maine. Are any of these slides or maps available online or yeah, there is a publication in the Journal of Biogeography. Um, there's another one uh, back in 19, oh no, 2002. Um, I, you can email me at cdcogville.gmail.com. I can send you a, a PDF of that. Uh, there is a Paleon, which is this big project, has been publishing maps. And NSF funded means that all of the underlying raw data has to be available. So they're supplementary, and there's a, a close one article that came out two years ago that has all the Minnesota to Maine stuff. By the way, that's what the new um, EPA requirement is. You can't uh, base EPA um, rules on things that don't have raw data published. So a lot of modern publishing is just throwing out raw data that nobody else will be able to figure out what's going on. But it makes it legitimate. But uh, yeah, there are two, at least two publications that have summary stuff. And I, I, give me an email, I can send you what your own town is, what your county is, uh, whatever you, you might, or what your students might want to do. Well, we've got some Montpelier uh, teachers around. Uh, we might uh, uh, revisit some of the corners in Calus or Cabot or uh, Montpelier or whatever. Uh, see what's there today. I can take you to one place on the Max Gray Road and you can say, here stood a <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to stay around a little longer if people have particular questions, but thank you very much. And